right so uh, uh, welcome everyone and uh, i see most of the many of the faces uh, from uh, or the, 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 the people from shri yoga but there may be a few others that are not, not part of shri yoga uh, and the ravi ji i think you know ravi ji you know that just put the video on uh, so he has attended some of the mantra sessions um, so go ahead swami ji you can start okay so I request all of you to please sit comfortably. Before we begin, we shall chant Om three times. Sit comfortably. If you are in a meditative posture, yes. Or if you are sitting in a chair, if you are sitting in a chair, ensure that the feet are on the ground and the seat is not wobbly. Eyes gently closed. head neck shoulders and back in a straight line become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes awareness of your head neck shoulders back arms legs the whole body Shift your awareness to your breath. Normal, spontaneous breathing coupled with awareness. I am breathing in, and I am breathing out, and I am aware I am breathing in, and I am aware I am breathing out. Let this be the form of your awareness for a few moments. Shift your awareness to your eyebrow center, brow matya, and at the brow matya, visualize the form of a brightly burning jyoti, a flame, and maintaining your awareness on this experience at the eyebrow center, we shall chant the mantra Om three times, followed by the Shanti mantras, taking in a deep breath. ओ Sir, gently step your palms against each other. Place the palms on both your eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from the palms to your eyes, to the brain, to the whole body. And then gently move the palms away. Open your eyes. Hari Om. Sir, Sir, Namo Narayan. Jai Ho. so a warm welcome to all the participants of this session today we will be trying to understand a little bit more about hypertension and also explore if yoga has something to offer but before we do that 
I would like to first discuss what is blood pressure. All of us now know this term blood pressure. We also use it. Oh, such and such thing has happened and my pressure just shot through the roof. But what exactly is denoted by blood pressure? There are some who are medical professionals, so I'm sure they would know about it. But for others, I think it is worthwhile understanding it in detail. Our heart is like a pump and it pumps blood with enough force that the blood can circulate all throughout the body and then has enough pressure left so that it comes back into the heart once again. We can understand this if you have a long hose pipe and this hose pipe is connected to one end of the pump and this hose pipe if it is straightened then whatever is the pressure with which the water is thrown out water is going to flow with almost the same pressure but if we coil the pipe round and round and round if we join it in multiple places then soon the pressure starts falling down so blood pressure is the pressure by which the heart pumps blood into the circulatory system by which it goes to every cell in the body, almost every cell. And along with this, there is another component. When the heart, the heart does not pump like a motor pump that is continuously throwing out water. It throws out in spurts. So in between the two spurts and that is what we feel as the heartbeat. When the heart pumps the blood out, there is a point where the walls shut and when the walls get shut, there is a sound which we can feel if we place the hand on the palm on the chest. Now, the higher level, the systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure with which the heart ejects the blood. But al along with this, there is another aspect. You need to have this blood vessels, these blood vessels, they should not collapse. They should maintain the patency. You know, the tube, if the tube collapses, then it is not possible for the blood to go to the different parts of the tissues. And you know very well that if there is not enough blood which goes to the brain, we start feeling lightheaded and we sometimes faint. The same thing happens in different organs also. So the other aspect of blood pressure is the ability to maintain enough basal pressure so that the blood vessels, the bigger vessels, the medium vessels, even the smaller vessels do not collapse completely. And the blood is continuously supplied to the entire body at all times. Now, there are multiple factors which cause this. Some factors are due to the brain impulses. Some factors are due to the hormonal impulses. Some factors are due to the local feedback which comes from the different parts of the body. Some factors are due to the autonomic nervous system. So, we do not have a single factor which determines blood pressure. There are multiple factors. And the body has got different requirements at different points of time. 
if we need to run then the legs and the other body parts will demand more blood if we need to digest food those body parts will demand more blood if we have to think a lot we have to do use our brain a lot that is going to consume more blood pressure so different parts of the body apply and keep on giving requirements to the heart and the heart has to keep on adjusting to the requirements of all and when there is a mismatch between there is a discrepancy between the multiple informations which are coming in and there is a spillover then there is a problem when you need more work to be done at that time the pressure of the heart blood pressure goes high but after the peak requirement is met pressure comes down to the basal level this is very important if this returning back to normal to the baseline the recalibration does not happen then it remains at a higher level and when it remains at a higher level over a sustained period of time that leads to the phenomena known as blood pressure 50 years ago 60 years ago this was relatively less common only specific types of people would have this but given the modern lifestyle blood pressure has become almost like a constant companion to all the people why is that that is because there are multiple inputs which are continuously being bombarded on us and these inputs do not allow the return to the baseline and when the blood pressure remains high because of increased requirements for a long period of time then there is a resetting in our system and the blood pressure remains at a higher level in the same way as in the olden days when we had the weighing scales and it was a spring and you use the spring you overuse it you misuse it after some time the zero would shift and then you would need to go and recalibrate it bring it back to the zero mark in something same way happens in the body and when this happens then we have the condition known as hypertension what are the problems of hypertension when we have hypertension then we have multiple problems which can come up all over the body i do not need to go into the details of that because that is freely available all over but what we need to understand is that the basis of hypertension today for most of the people of course every every case has to be looked into properly and then we can advise but we can certainly agree that there are some common factors erratic lifestyle inappropriate diet inappropriate mental patterns sedentary behavior these four five create a disturbance and this creates a disturbance and gives rise to something which now is known as the metabolic syndrome diabetes or pre diabetes obesity or weight management problems which will automatically include dyslipidemia or cholesterol hypertension and some related heart problems so when these four or five things come together they have now been called as the metabolic syndrome high metabolic syndrome 
because it has been found that all these factors come about because the normal metabolic system of the body undergoes a change and this changed metabolic system creates a side effect which is seen manifests as blood pressure as diabetes increased blood sugar as in increased uh, adipose tissue fat tissue cholesterol as sometimes heart problem because the heart is being overworked so long so manifestations are multiple the root cause is imbalance in the metabolic system. and one of the definitions of yoga is restoring balance samatvam yoga uchchate maintaining balance is yoga so whenever there is an imbalance yoga creates some changes by which the balance is created many of us think that yoga means some asanas some pranayam and maybe a little bit of a meditation but yoga is much much more than that yoga is in swami shivanand ji's terms yoga is the system which maintains harmony between the head the heart the hands the head meaning intellect heart meaning emotions hands meaning shins when there is imbalance between these two these three then there is a state which is non harmonious and if we have been to a, an orchestra where there are multiple music instruments playing then we will know that each and every instrument needs to function work in exact precise times one instrument goes up the other falls silent then one goes down the other comes up and then we have beautiful music but if they start going off tune they start playing as they wish what is going to happen we will be having cacophony we will be having noise not music yoga is that system which reestablishes music from noise and to be able to do that it uses four important aspects first is diet second is lifestyle habits third is mental patterns and fourth is yogic practices if we only practice yogic practices we will not have the complete benefit but if you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 then there is a synergy which develops and that leads to improvement in the systems in the body it allows all this imbalance to go down it resets the functionings and some of the most important factors are the functioning of the neuro hormonal system and the autonomic nervous system these two are crucial and the yogic practices when practiced correctly they work on these they have a balancing effect on these and when that balance is established everything else is reset by the body so we do not have to go and attend to increased functioning of the heart we don't have to 
go and attend to joint pains and liver problem and sugar problem and this and that and that. No, you go to the root. What is the root? The neurohormonal system has an apex at the center inside the brain. And very funnily, there is a couple of small organs, or small part centers in the brain, which are responsible for most of these activities. The moment we recalibrate these, everything else comes into that is something which is in. so if we are practicing asanas then we need to remember to practice them in the system they are not just physical exercises asan is a practice by which we manipulate the inner energy which is within us the pranic energy and as we manipulate the pranic energy, different parts of the body are perfused by that energy. Point number one. Also, the asanas exert an impact on the brain, on the hormonal systems. They recalibrate. When we perform pranayam, it is even more powerful. Just before we started, we had someone who mentioned about the when I have started doing the breathing practices which Vikanji is taking then I am able to control myself better I am able to manage myself better that is a very very important point I would like to explain to you why because based on this we will understand the functioning of the principle of functioning of all yoga therapy. When we breathe, we, our breathing centers are in the brain. And there is a center known as the hypothalamus, which is in very close communication with these respiratory centers. Any disturbance in the hypothalamus disturbs the respiratory centers. And we know this. The moment we are afraid, we start hyperventilating. The moment we get angry, we start hyperventilating. We are not running around. We are not exerting physically, but still we start hyperventilating. Why? Because the hypothalamus is overactive. Emotions are overactive. That spillover affects the respiratory centers and we start hyperventilating. In yoga, what we do is we make use of this connection and reverse the whole thing. When we have rhythmic, regular, specific frequency breathing, manifestation is here. You are breathing in and out. But the impulses are coming from the respiratory centers. And these impulses, they spill over onto the hypothalamus and other centers, calming them down, recalibrating them, changing the way they are functioning. And when that happens, automatically we are able to make a change in ourselves. That is perhaps the reason why when there is a saying that if you get angry, please wait, count till 10 and then. So when you are going to count till 10, you are not just going to wait and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But you have to count slow. So that means you are going to breathe and not automatically you start breathing deeper. And those of you who have been practicing yoga would know that when we 
breathe. When we use abdominal breathing, especially long, deep abdominal breathing is a very powerful way of managing emotions. Why? Abdomen and brain have no connection that way. But the connection is in there. This connection is what we make use of. And we also make use of another connection. I don't know if many of you know, but the number of nerve cells, neurons, which are there in our digestive system from the mouth to the anus is almost equal to the active neurons in the brain. So we can say certainly that the digestive system is a brain in itself. When we eat incorrectly, when our digestive system goes haywire, it has a very strong impact on our brain, functioning of the brain. That is the second aspect which we have to understand. I had mentioned diet. I had not mentioned practices first. I had mentioned diet. Why? Because this is something which is very, very powerful in fact. Also, it has been shown that the gut flora, the gut flora has an impact on the functioning of the gut neurons and that has an impact on the brain. Again, that has an impact. The kidneys, now speci speaking specifically of blood pressure, the kidneys which are responsible for flushing out all toxins from our bloodstream, they have got a very close relation with blood pressure. There is an enzyme which is secreted in the kidney. That enzyme is processed in the lungs and it has an impact on your blood pressure. There are medicines which are used to block this enzyme. And when that happens, then you are able to bring your blood pressure. But we never think, we never pause to think, what is it that makes the kidney secrete this enzyme excessively? Why not understand that basis and make a change so that the kidney itself does not secrete that much? If the kidney is not going to secrete that enzyme, blood pressure is not going to rise because that enzyme is not in the blood, that excessive stimulation is not going to take place. So that is another aspect of maintaining. And mind you, it doesn't only affect the blood pressure, it affects the entire thalamic system. In last 20-30 years, the central obesity has gone up. Obesity in itself is a factor for hypertension. So, this again happens because our metabolic system has gone through Yogic practices, a proper integrated approach to yogic practices, diet, lifestyle and mental patterns make a difference bringing this imbalance into balance and please remember that the human body has got almost infinite ability to heal itself. All we need to do is allow the body to heal itself. We just have to take those extraneous factors away and the body will heal itself. Is what we need to do. We don't even need to go to higher practices of yoga. With higher practices, many more things are possible. But we don't even need that. Proper diet, because your gut is working there. Enough water. Most of us drink less water. We are dehydrated, chronic dehydration. Not great de degree of dehydration. Small degree of dehydration for a long period of time affects your kidneys. 
erratic food affects not only the digestive system but it also affects our biorhythms they go off our erratic lifestyle we sleep at some time we get up at any time not in sync with how the body functions when first try and wake up somewhere near sunrise sleep somewhere just after sunset or at a specific time rest for at least 6 to 8 hours that is very essential these two things will take care of 30 to 40% of our problems then the mental patterns we think too much and as we have understood earlier when we think there are lots of emotions which come up and when there are emotions again the hypothalamus and the neurohormonal axis gets overactive when that gets overactive effect on the blood pressure comes in so when we change our mental patterns again we are reducing the imbalance and then the yogic practices yogic practices are crucial please don't think that i am trying to say yogic practices are not important because we cannot easily make lifestyle changes we cannot easily make changes in the mental patterns diet yes we can exercises yes we can but these two are not easy to make because our will power is almost non existent how do we change that we begin with asanas we begin with pranayam some premeditative practices with yoga nidra but please don't limit yourself to that yoga should not be only practiced on the yoga mat but yoga must be lived 24/7 it is not enough to practice yoga it is essential to live yoga yoga not performing asanas the whole day but living the principles of harmony of balance of equipoise of appropriateness and how to do that begin with appropriate asanas depending on our age depending on our ailments because if we have got hypertension and if we are 50 plus quite good chances that we also have got back ache we have joint pains we have other problems so we might not be able to do very many asanas not a problem because what is very essential is when we are doing any asana there is a system to be followed asanas are not just physical exercises that we just keep on moving our body we might as well do some aerobics we might as well do some gym we might do it some other forms they are not wrong they are very very beneficial but that is not yoga in yoga we are re establishing the harmony action is happening outside skanda chakra action is happening outside griva sanchalan action is happening outside makarasan bhujanga asan action is happening outside marjari asan many asans but they have an impact because the impulses come from the brain move the neck forward roll it to your right roll it back roll it to the left now when we include the component of awareness in this then there is another dimension which comes in how is it if you close your eyes and then i raise your hand do you know where your hand is even without seeing you can tell almost accurately the position of your hand you ask the uh, other hand to be raised to the same degree you are able to do that why because there is another system within the neurological system which tells us the positioning of the body and when we use awareness then we start using that system and when we start using that system that system has an impact on all centers of the brain 
So when we have a rhythm which is being set all throughout the brain, action is happening outside. You are doing an asana outside, but impact is happening inside. The brain waves, impulses are being recalibrated, synchronized, harmonized. And then when you include breath, then you are converging brain activity, neurohormonal activity. And third, when you in include visualization, then it goes to the next level. So you might be physically doing a very simple practice of Skanda Chakra or Griva Chakra or Bhujangasan. You don't have to do Shirshasan or all those acrobatics. You have to follow this system. When an asan is supposed to be done, then it has to be done in a system. Swami Niranjan Ananji, the Paramacharya of Bihar School of Yoga, he mentioned that when we do an asan, it should be done in five dimensions with physical awareness, with breath awareness, with visualization. And two more, five for the five koshas. You are connecting to the five koshas. Annamai, Anamai, Nomai. Vijnanamai and Anandamai, they are slightly higher, which we can wait for the moment. But these three dimensions, we must do. And when we are doing this, we are actually training our brain, our mind, our system. So, even the simplest of the asan can have some of the most profound impacts if we do it correctly. So, please understand how the practices are to be done and then do them. Combine them, not just asan, but asan, pranayam, meditation together. That is going to make a difference. And that will make a change along with diet, along with lifestyle habits, along with mental practice. When we start improving our systems, then we get the ability to have the willpower to make those changes for lifestyle habits, for the mental patterns. 70% of the job is done. Diet, 100% of the job is done. Not only hypertension, not only diabetes, not only the metabolic syndromes, but Almost all diseases can be managed by this. That is why yoga is known as a holistic science. If I say, oh, you are having hypertension, please do one, two, three, four asanas. Then there is no difference between saying that, oh, please take this tablet, that tablet, that tablet. Instead of prescribing tablets, I'm prescribing asanas. One asana for one uh, problem, another asana for another problem. No. Asana is asana. Pranayam, yoga is yoga in fact. And that has an impact and it changes the entire system. So once we know this, then we can start making a change. I think we are uh, at 8.15. With this, I would like to conclude the introduction to the practices, the lifestyles, the mental patterns, and I. If you have any questions, if there is anything which you would like to ask or discuss, we can do that. We have, Srikanji, we have uh, 15 minutes almost, right? Uh, 15 minutes, but that can be extended in, in case people have more questions. Okay. So, I mean, you know, you, you have the link uh, and I'm not sure, you know, if it extends beyond one hour. Uh, if no, no, people... that, 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 that's, op it's open. That's not a problem. Yes. Okay. So, uh, one more thing is that you see, uh, Swami Shivananda used to say that an ounce of practice is much more than a ton of theory. So, uh, I will request for 10 minutes after whatever questions, etc. happen, 10 minutes of a small practice before we close. Excellent idea. 
Hare Gauri. Now we can, uh, if there are any questions, any, anybody would like to ask, discuss anything? Open for... Can I ask a question? My name is Ravi. Yes. So, Mike, uh, I have a question uh, twofold. One is, uh, what asanas should be avoided or what asanas should be done uh, if we have the hypertension? And the second question is uh, regarding food. Uh, what uh, foods are beneficial and what food should be avoided or timing of the uh, intake of the food or whatever relates, uh, relates to hypertension? So if you can elaborate uh, on these two points, I will appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a very nice question. Um, in general, all asanas which are forward bending, which are inverted asanas, they should be avoided. Because when you are doing excessive forward bending, then there is a chance of increasing the pressure. If you are doing inverted asanas, you are increasing the pressure on the brain. That can create a lot of problem. And if we already are having hypertension, it means that our blood vessels are under an excessive strain. We should not strain them. So therefore, these two especially. And third thing is uh, not too much of dynamic asanas. Because if we do excessive dynamic asanas, that in itself can increase your blood pressure. So we need to be careful of these three points. That is as regards blood pressure and asanas. About diet. You see, I spoke of, briefly I spoke about rhythms. Our digestive system is most active and able to take care digest food at three times in the day. First, which is around sunrise. Second, which is around midday. Third, which is around sunset. Once the sun has set, then our digestive system also lowers its functioning. Therefore, ideally, we should not eat anything after sunset. I am speaking of ideally, I am not speaking in today's times. In today's times, situation might be different. But at least we can try to have breakfast around 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, depending on what sun, time is the sunrise. I am speaking at India time. Now, uh, closer to the poles, we will have uh, a different uh, system. Lunch should be around midday. That does not change. Dinner should be around 6 o'clock or so. Whatever be the time, try to maintain regularity in the meals. Not to the dot, but 15 minutes to half an hour here and there is okay. But not more than that. Because when we eat at the same time, you will, you will know, you will notice that the secretions in the stomach and the intestines, they synchronize to those times. There was one gentleman, he was telling me once that on other days, he would feel if he skips a meal, he would feel very hungry or by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, he would feel very hungry. But on Ekadashi, that person used to do Ekadashi and Tuesday fasting. Right from childhood, he said, when it is Tuesday and when it is Ekadashi, I don't have a problem. My stomach doesn't feel, you know, I don't get any burning. I don't feel hungry. Everything goes. What had happened? The system had adjusted because over a period of time, the body system had learned that on these days, functioning is different. The body had adjusted it to it. And because there is a regularity in there, the functioning improves. So, meal times, try to keep it fixed. Ideally, don't keep between more than four to five hours between two meals. So, if you are having breakfast at, say, seven o'clock, have lunch to around 11 o'clock, have uh, 
some brunch around four o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, and dinner around seven o'clock again. That way you are spreading your meals or eat intake over 12 hours. You are not loading the system, allowing the digestive system to function well. And if it is easily possible, I would recommend fasting once a week or skipping a meal once a week if it is easy. But when we skip a meal or when we fast, it means we do not eat or we eat something which is very light for digestion. I have seen people who eat, oh, because it's a fast, so I eat more things because I'm fasting. Please don't do that. That's not helpful. So these three things, if you follow, they will be quite beneficial. I hope it helps you. Is that Ravi? Yes, Ravi. Yes. So what are these uh, uh, exercises which are considered uh, dynamic or uh, I don't know the right word. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you are doing uh, Surya Namaskar at a fast pace, if you are doing Chakrasan, if you are doing uh, Paschimottanasana and Halasan, you know, these are things where if you are doing them slow, that's a different story. But Paschimottanasana is bending forward. Halasan is going back, inverting. So if you are doing this rapidly, it is going to create a lot of stress on the system. So these types of things should be avoided. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. So Radha, you are on mute, so unmute yourself. Namaste, I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Radha. It's so nice to hear you saying, uh, you know, very good things about uh, your, uh, you know, lifestyle and diet and everything. It's really wonderful. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one thing, uh, like for, uh, uh, I, you know, my, my husband has diabetes and I keep hearing from people, he's, he's not supposed to eat this fruit, that fruit. Can you tell me like we, uh, what fruits that we need to avoid when you, when, uh, you have diabetes? In general, uh, in diabetes, mm -hmm. we should try and avoid complex carbohydrates. Avoid glucose, fructose, is okay. Uh, chemically, uh, fructose and glucose, they are two different forms of sugar. They are okay. Many of the fruits, they have fructose in it. They are, that is okay. So therefore, if you have apples, they are okay. Uh, if you have citrus fruits, they are okay. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what, what else are the fruits which are available over there. I mean, like uh, uh, mango, you know, banana, a lot of people say, he, you know, we, diabetic patients shouldn't eat the grapes, but uh, some say it's okay. So in I'm a little... In moderation is okay. In moderation is okay. Not moderation. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in diabetes, we need to understand one thing, that diabetes is not an ailment of sugar metabolism disorder. Diabetes is an ailment of metabolic disorder because even though it is insulin and the most prominent function of insulin is sugar metabolism, but insulin has a very strong impact on protein metabolism also as well as on fat metabolism. So when insulin levels are going up and down, these others are also being affected. We cannot me measure the protein levels and fat levels so easily. Sugar levels are very easy to measure and they are the most drastic. So therefore, the common thought has been diabetes. I mean, I mean in India, another name for diabetes is, oh, mujhe sugar hai. <laughs> That's what people say. But we need to understand that it is more than that. We need to bring this metabolism back to normal. We should not stop things in med uh, moderation. Secondly, depending on the age, depending on other uh, complications and comorbidities also, but yes. please understand that uh, diabetes also happens because there, there is a, a saying, water, water everywhere, 
not a drop to drink yes same way sugar sugar everywhere not a drop in the blood cells uh, in the body cells sugar is there in your blood but not in the body the body is starving mm -hmm. so yes. it is essential that the sugar needs to go and that is what is another big factor which is coming up insulin resistance mm -hmm. so our body cells they become resistant to insulin one of the best or easiest methods which have been found is the good old karla karela karela has been shown to modify these insulin receptors so you know that way we can utilize different things but uh, eat in moderation don't eat too much don't have a big meal uh, small meals about 3 hours apart um, again depending a lot on the uh, other comor comorbidities also yes yes i understand thank you sir appreciate it thank you amma Well, if you have more questions, you can always uh, uh, ask uh, Swami Ji uh, or Shilpa. Can you know, she, she can put the contacts, uh, Shilpa, uh, and uh, so that way, if you have more questions, uh, you can uh, ask them. And uh, also, this is kind of a, a webinar uh, with, which will be followed by some kind of. Uh, you know, Shilpa will contact you, you know, about. Uh, uh uh you kind know, of swami ji plans to have you kind know, of sessions regularly uh uh to manage uh, hypertension and again not just hypertension but overall you know your you know uh, you know it could be you know the diabetes or any other similar metabolic uh, issues uh and so you know we are welcome to you know uh, contact them and uh, you know get more information and uh, probably at this time swami ji maybe you know we you know do this 10 minutes that you're you know thinking about wonderful so please sit comfortably we will be doing a short practice of guided relaxation a simpler form of yoga nidra it has been shown many times that just with yoga nidra the hypertension of many people have come down i personally have seen many patients who were on anti hypertensives and after i started them with yogic practices and especially yoga nidra their blood pressure started going below normal and i had to reduce their tablets please do not take this as a uh, indication that we can change the dosage on our own do it in consultation with your physician because there are many factors which can't just be explained you know all of them can't be explained here but point to be made is yoga nidra is a very very powerful practice which can allow us to regain our balance relax ourselves and refresh ourselves please let us practice a short round of yoga please sit comfortably with your hands on your knees in dhyan or chin mudra head neck shoulders back all in a straight line eyes and mouth gently closed become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes awareness of your head neck shoulders arms chest upper back abdomen lower back hips legs the whole body if there is any excessive tension anywhere consciously get rid of that tension if you need to move a part of your body your shoulders or your your neck or your waist 
you can do that and allow the tension to dissipate. Make yourself comfortable. If you are wearing glasses, remove them. If you are wearing a watch, remove it. If you are wearing a belt or tight trousers, remove the belt or loosen the belt or the band so that you are comfortable. And as early as possible, come into a position of complete relaxed stillness. We shall be in this position for next 10 to 15 minutes. There are few important instructions in the practice of yoga nidra. First important instruction being do not try hard mentally. Just keep on listening to my instructions. Whatever you can follow easily, keep on doing internally. But keep on moving with the pace of the instructions. If you are unable to perform any activity suggested, just drop that and move ahead with the instruction. Don't get stuck. Keep on moving. As far as possible, try not to move your body. And try not to fall asleep. Keep on being awake and keep on listening to my instructions. In the beginning and at the end of Yoga Nidra, we should take a sankalpa, a resolution. A resolution is like a seed sown in the depths of your consciousness. Anything in life can fail you, but not the sankalpa taken in the beginning and at the end of Yoga Nidra and nurtured properly. A sankalpa should be simple, it should be positive, it should be uncomplicated. If you have a sankalpa, you can repeat that mentally three times. And if you have not thought about a sankalpa, you can take the sankalpa of positive health, the physical, mental, emotional, and social dimensions. Repeat the sankalpa to yourself mentally three times. I shall enumerate the different parts of the body and you will rotate your awareness along the different body parts. Do not move the body part. Do not open your eyes and look at that body part. Just become aware. My right hand thumb exists and just repeat the name mentally and if it is easily possible, Visualize that body part. Let us begin. Become aware of the right hand thumb, second finger, third finger, fourth, fifth, all five fingers together, palm, back of the palm, wrist, elbow, shoulder, armpit, Upper back, lower back, hip, thigh, kneecap, calf muscle, ankle, heel, sole, right big toe, 
second toe, third, fourth, fifth, all five toes together, the whole right side, the body. Bring your awareness to the left side, left hand thumb, second finger, third, fourth, fifth, all five fingers together, palm, back of the palm, wrist, elbow, shoulder, armpit, upper back, lower back, hip, thigh, kneecap, calf muscle, ankle, heel, sole, left big toe, second toe, third, fourth, fifth, all five toes together, the whole left side of the body. Bring your awareness to the top of the head, the top of the head, the crown of the head, forehead, right eyebrow, left eyebrow, eyebrow center, right eye, left eye, right ear, left ear, right cheek, left cheek, right nostril, left nostril, both the nostrils together, upper lip, lower lip, both the lips together, chin, throat, neck, right shoulder blade, left shoulder blade, right arm complete, left arm complete, right side of the chest, left side of the chest, abdomen, the navel rising and falling with your respiration, upper back, lower back, right hip, left hip, right leg complete, left leg complete, the whole body, the whole body, the whole body, the whole body, the whole body. Become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes. The whole body is still, stationary, comfortable. And in this still, stationary body, only the movement of respiration is going on. You are breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. We shall now count our breaths. We shall do this in the reverse direction from 27 to 1. Inhalation, exhalation, 27. Inhalation, exhalation, 26. And so on. From 27 to 1. And if you make a mistake anywhere, if you fumble in the count, go back to 27 and start all over again. You can begin your count now. Maintain your awareness on your breath, on the count.
And now complete your counting. Drop the awareness of the count. Recollect the number you have reached. Repeat it mentally. And bring your awareness to the sankalpa you had taken in the beginning of the yoga nidra practice. Repeat your sankalpa three times. Slowly start externalizing your awareness. The practice of yoga nidra is coming to an end. Externalize your awareness. Become aware of all the contact points between the floor and the body. The contact points between the body and the clothes. Body and the breeze. Externalize your awareness and become aware of the sounds and smells coming from inside your room. Externalize your awareness more and become aware of the sounds, situations and circumstances outside the room. And once you have externalized your awareness completely, then bring your awareness back to the body. Gently move the fingers of the hands, toes of the feet, roll the neck slightly from right side to side. Interlock your fingers, stretch them above the head. Give your body a good stretch. Bring your hands back. And then get ready to chant the mantra Om three times while maintaining the awareness of the feeling you are able to experience at this point of time. Taking in a deep breath to chant home. Oh. Oh. Gently set up your palms against each other. Place them on the closed eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from the palms to your eyes, to the brain, to the whole body. Then gently move the palms away. Open your eyes. Ariyom, Ratsat, Navonarayan. So with this, we complete our session today. Over to you, Sri Kanji. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining the session. And again, if you want to participate in uh, you know, uh, the sessions that uh, Swamiji will be conducting in the next uh, three months, uh, uh, you can contact him. And again, if you so the uh, I think there was some question about recording, and I think Shilpa already answered that question. Uh, it will be available uh, to people uh, that uh, have uh, you know uh, uh, on Sri Yoga or you know uh, the other you know uh, people that have sent the email, uh, they you will get the recording. And uh, so all the best to you. And again, uh, thank you, Swamiji and Shilpa for arranging arranging this session. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure, Shrikanji, to be with you once again.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.